Today we're going to be taking a look inside the Toyota S series of engines. This one here is a 2 liter 4 cylinder 3S GE engine. Now the S series of engines ran from about mid 80s to the mid 2000s. A really strong engine. This one is a more performance oriented engine being the GE. There was also a turbo version called the GTE. These used to build about 160 to 180 horsepower which is quite a lot for a 2 liter 4 cylinder from about 25 years ago. Taking a quick look around this engine you can see we have a dual overhead cam design here driven off of a timing belt underneath this timing cover. This is your accessory side of the engine where your power steering, AC and all alternator would go. We have a metal valve cover at the top here with an iron block at the bottom here and hidden underneath this exhaust manifold is a really difficult to access oil filter. Now taking a look at the back of this engine, this is where the firewall would be when it's mounted transversely. We do have a mechanical throttle body over here as well as a very unique intake system here. It's got an individual runner for each valve because it's got eight intake valves, two per cylinder. Furthermore, we do have this distributor which is driven off of the intake camshaft. This is before coil unplug became standard. Now this engine came out of a Celica that was just sitting in a farm. We don't know what's wrong with it or if it ran, so we're gonna tear it down to see what happened. First thing we're gonna do is pull off the intake and the exhaust manifold to make some room. And a couple of 14 millimeter nuts later, now one theme you're going to notice with this engine is that everything seems very heavy and overbuilt. This thing is really really heavy and I bet this is probably where they bolted up the turbocharger for the GTE versions of this engine being that this was the basis for the turbocharged version. Now looking at this air intake you can see back in the old days they didn't really integrate the intake and any other accessories into the engine. They've actually used a lot of these bracketry. You can see there's a bracket here that holds it up and that bracket goes back over there to the front of the head and there's another bracket at the back here. And then you can see there's another bracket over here in addition to all the bolts at the bottom here that hold this intake to the head. It really seems like there was an afterthought here when it came to adding accessories to the bare block and head. And I'll go ahead and remove some of these. Underneath the intake manifold you have two vacuum switching valves and surprisingly they're still using old style connectors using this wire clip here to hold them on. I think I got enough vacuum hoses and wires disconnected. Now back in the 80s and 90s, less thought was put into designing things for manufacturing. You can imagine the person who has to install this on the assembly line will have to connect all of these little hoses and wires and everything and crisscross them and then put the intake on. It should definitely not be like this, especially on a modern vehicle. Hopefully this is the last wire and then I can get this intake off. And with the air intake out of the way, you can see that this is one of the later models of 3S engines that have fuel injection. This is your injection rail over here. It's port injected directly down into the intake runners. You've got one injector per cylinder, which means that they have to share it in between the two runners here. Now what's also cool is that the valve cover gasket is super simple to change. It's actually just Phillip bolts that go all the way around, about eight of them, and you can change your valve cover pretty easily without even taking off the intake because that kind of hangs out back here. We'll go ahead and remove the 12 millimeter bolts for the fuel rail. And then I can remove the fuel rail with the four injectors. Next we're going to take off this ignition system. Here we have the distributor and here we have your spark plug wires, which you don't need any tools for, they just pop right off. Pull out this distributor. Taking a quick look at the cooling setup on here, it's pretty simple. You got your upper and lower radiator hoses. The upper radiator hose is going to come up to this port over here. You got your coolant temperature sensor. That's going to go into the block circulate. We've got our water pump which is driven off of the timing belt here just behind the thermostat housing and then that's going to go back to the radiator. These two hoses here are your thermostat bypass which is essentially going to short circuit your radiator and the other one goes to your heater and your throttle body. Get the coolant inlet off. Let's take off that coolant inlet and then you can see your coolant temperature sensors are in there. Thermostat off. Alright next up I'm going to turn to the front of the engine here. First remove some of these accessories and remove this power steering pump. Next up I'm going to remove the timing cover of the engine. I'm going to give this crank bolt a shot. I don't have high hopes. I'm going to remove the upper timing cover. I'm going to knock these intake and exhaust cap bolts loose. And if you look closely this tensioner wheel actually moves side to side here and there's a spring in here that keeps timing belt tension. See if I can relieve some timing belt tension here. I'm just going to use this timing belt removal tool here. Here we are. I'm just going to use my crank pulley removal tool here. Here. Taking a look at the timing belt setup on this engine, you can see at the bottom here we have the crankshaft. Then we have an idler pulley over here, the water pump. 
the tensioner would sit in the middle here and then your intake and your exhaust camshafts down over here we have another pulley for your oil pump this guy luckily just pulls right off and remove this pulley here and remove the idler pulley all right down in this section here we have what looks like the oil pump all right now i'm going to remove the water pump bolt now that water pump is actually part of the thermostat assembly so that comes off as one entire unit here with these two pipes for the bypass just remove these cams the valve covers on these old toyota engines are pretty much a joke they just use phillips screws and there's not even much torque to them so i got to remove this spacer here for the spark plugs and there's actually two separate valve covers in here let's go ahead and remove these bolts too all right let's pop off this valve cover here this valve cover here as you can see things are pretty clean under here and there's not that much oil deposits which means that this engine was definitely sitting for a while you can see some of the cams here have some rust marks maybe there was some condensation inside of this engine that caused it to rust while sitting this here is the exhaust side with two exhaust valves per cylinder and then this here is the intake side with again two valves per cylinder it wasn't until the late 90s when this engine got variable valve timing but there was no variable valve lift type of system anyways well at least they were using an original toyota oil filter on this guy Jeez, that's on there. We have to use an extension on that one. Just remove this timing cover. All right, next up, we're going to remove these camshafts. We're going to start here at the exhaust camshaft with these 10 millimeter nuts. Now you can see there's some slight scoring on these cam bearings here. Ooh. This one's got a lot of rust buildup. Yeah, the intake doesn't look nearly as scored up. You're looking down underneath the valve cover, the exhaust side looks pretty clean, but unfortunately, on the intake side, we do have quite the sludge buildup over here. Now this does use a direct acting cam on bucket design as opposed to using a rocker arm style valve train. Inside of here we do have the head bolt. But these head bolts are actually an 8mm hex. These are actually pretty loose. Gonna go ahead and zip these off. Alright, I'll go ahead and remove the head. Taking a look at the top of the cylinder head, you can see things are looking really crusty. There's a lot of carbon in here. You also see that these engines still use the composite style gasket. It's not a multi-layer steel gasket. So when you're doing a head job in one of these, it's pretty difficult to clean off. Now down underneath the head, things look normal with the exception of this valve here on the exhaust side of cylinder number four, which is stuck in the down position. All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn this engine over. Let's see if there's any mess. Oh yeah, there's something in there. Taking a look at the bottom of this engine here, you can see we have a stamp steel oil pan. This is the before the days of the cast aluminum or plastic oil pan. And you can see it's taken quite the impact without any leaks. So I'm going to go ahead and remove all the 10 millimeter bolts that hold this oil pan on. All right, now I'm going to remove this oil pan. Kind of yucky on the inside there. All right, taking a look at this engine from underneath, you can see here, this is the oil pickup tube. It's got a screen on it. Now the screen isn't too nasty just from sitting there. The engine itself actually turns over pretty smoothly. I don't hear any weird noises or notice anything abnormal. Now this engine is actually a very reliable engine, especially for making so much horsepower from a little four cylinder. But what I'm really surprised about is they're only using two bolts to hold the main cap on. Many other vehicles will use four bolts or even cross bolted from the outside here. But this one just gets away with using two bolts. Let's get this little pickup tube off here. And I can remove the pickup tube here. Taking a look at the crankshaft layout here, just like many other four-cylinder engines, it uses five main bearing caps. Now you've got the counterweights on the opposite side of the connecting rod cap, and that's just to cancel out some of the rotating mass of vibration. Now if you step up to the 2.2 liter 5S FE Camry engine, that one has a balance shaft built in, and that's because that application doesn't make as much power, and it's expected to be a little bit more smooth and refined. Alright, I'm going to go ahead and start removing the connecting rod caps. Okay, looking here. All right, it looks like we have a big heat spot over there, just like the other one. Okay, let's see what number three looks like. Same thing, no abnormal wear. And number two looks good as well. Now taking a look at all the pistons itself, I don't notice any abnormal wear or damage to them. But one thing I really like about these older Toyota engines is they're just so meaty and heavy. And it feels like it could take a lot of power. Switch the fact that this engine did come turbocharged. All right, next up, we're going to get the oil pump housing out. The oil pump's pretty straightforward. You got oil that goes in here and it comes out through here to be exhausted into the block. Just remove this rear main seal. Gotta remember to remove the bolts before you put it on the engine stand. All right, now all I've got left is this rotating assembly. We're gonna go ahead and remove the 10 bolts that hold the main cap bearings on. We'll just zip those off. All right, let's take a look at the condition of these bearings. You can see it's actually pretty clean. There's only very slight scoring there. Again, we don't know the mileage of this engine, just the age, but it's actually not in bad shape. Like this engine hasn't failed by oil lubrication or anything. Oh my God, this thing is so heavy for a four banger. But that was pretty relaxing. Let's get this engine off the stand and take a look at some of the internal components.
So here we've got the entire engine laid out here. We're going to take a look at how it works. So starting at the bottom here where we have the steel oil pan, you can see we have a baffle here which tries to keep some of the oil down near the bottom so it can get sucked up by the suction tube. Now the oil pickup tube is then going to bring oil directly to the oil pump assembly. Now this oil pump assembly has an inlet over here where it's going to draw oil in. The oil pump is going to generate oil flow and then push it out through this port over here. Now this engine is from an era when oil pumps were actually serviceable items just like the water pump on your car. And you can actually replace this oil pump because it consists of a bearing and a seal that can actually wear out as opposed to newer engines where these are internally chain driven or crankshaft driven and not serviceable. You can see that the oil is going to flow over here. This is going to be your pressurized side. This is your neutral side and this is your pressure release valve. In case things get too pressurized it'll just vent it back down to the sump. Now that oil pump assembly is going to send oil through this oil port over here that's drilled into the block, get filtered out by the oil filter and that's going to send it down the oil galley that runs along the side of the block here from there all the way down to the back side over here. You can see on this side of the block here they've actually got a threaded insert here. This is again from an era when things were serviceable. Instead of using a freeze plug or pressing a ball you can actually unscrew this when you're rebuilding the engine to clean things out. Now that main oil galley is what's going to feed the crankshaft to lubricate it. So you can see there's a hole for each one of them here that's drilled down in order to lubricate it from this galley. Now coming up from that main oil galley here are the oil feed holes that's going to feed the head in order to lubricate its components. Now at the top of the engine here we can also see this composite gasket. There's actually not multiple layers like you'd expect in a modern engine. Now some people say that this seals better but the majority of engines have already moved over to multi-layer steel. Now looking at the face of the head here you can see it's got a semi-open block design here where it's got these reinforcement points here to make this engine a lot stronger. Again this being the 3S FE the more performance oriented version of this engine in addition to the turbocharged engine that was also available. Oh yeah this thing sticking out here is actually a coolant drain it sits at the bottom of the cooling jacket here and that's to drain the block. Nowadays engines you don't really see with that you just have to deal with the mess. Now taking a look at the piston design I really like it because it's nice beefy and chunky and can definitely hold a lot of power. Even the forge connecting rods feel very heavy. The piston head itself has indentations here for the valves. The rings themselves here are pretty thick and can hold a lot of compression and more importantly the oil control ring has a lot of gap in between them so they're not going to get clogged up as fast and tend to burn too much oil. Now moving along to this aluminum head here you can see we do have four valves per cylinder and that's the valve that looks like it's collapsed or bent. This here is an oil pressure damper because it runs off the oil galley that runs in here that lubricates everything. Now the way the oiling system works is you've got this port over here that's going to bring oil from the block. It's going to send oil up to where this pressure damper is and then that's also going to send oil off to this side. So you got an oil feed going down to this camshaft and another oil feed going down to this camshaft here. The oil is then going to come through this galley up to the first camshaft bearing here where it's going to lubricate that and it's also going to share some of that oil through the entire hollow camshaft to lubricate all of the other bearings. So taking a look at the condition of the combustion chamber, you can see that the spark plugs were a little bit grayish, brownish, just like the exhaust valves. You can tell there was some oil burning going on with this engine, especially given the condition of the piston heads and the amount of carbon buildup on the intake valves here. All of the other valve buckets want to come out with a magnet, except for this one. Well, something's definitely stuck. I just gave it a light tap with the hammer and it popped back in place. I think the valve is just stuck. There you go. Here's the valve bucket. Looks pretty rusty so I'd assume that's probably why it got stuck open when I turned the engine over. This one is also kind of rusty. Now one thing with Toyotas of this era, that includes the M series of engines from the old Supras, is that they've actually separated the intake channel and the exhaust channel and put the spark plugs down the middle. Now that's a really nice design for serviceability but modern four cylinder engines have actually put all this together under one valve cover and put the spark plug down in between. Now one thing I noticed with this exhaust is not a 421. It actually goes down to two separate exhaust ports over here. So I wonder if you could actually add two little turbos instead of one. Now if we take a look at how the variable intake system works, you can see we have these valves here that are going to open and close using this vacuum diaphragm. Now the amount of vacuum that's applied is controlled through these vacuum switching valves and that's going to vary how much air goes into the other valve of the engine. So you've got one valve of the engine that's always open taking air and the other one is variable. This just gives you a little bit more adjustability in terms of how you want the air to flow in the engine as well as to promote better mixing. I can actually take this off here and you can see what it looks like inside. Just another piece that sits in the intake. 
Supposedly the simpler models will just bolt a regular intake up to here. Now for those of you who don't like electronics in cars, I hope you like vacuum lines because there's lots of little diaphragms and solenoids and hoses that run everywhere and of course when things get old they will get brittle. So you'd have to diagnose this the old school way using like a smoke test or a pressure test or something. I just think it's super cool that there's an intake runner for each valve as opposed to each cylinder. Imagine you pop the hood in this car and you see eight intake runners, you might as well think it's a V8. And that's a wrap on the Toyota 3S GE engine. I think it's a really strongly built engine and holds a strong reputation for reliability and power just like the M series and J series of inline sixes in Toyota's lineup from back in the day. Of course if you do have a Toyota Camry with the 5S FE engine the setup inside is going to be very similar. Obviously not as strongly built because that car has less horsepower and less demand. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one. This is actually one of the cleanest engine teardowns I've done in a long time because this thing's been sitting dry for many years. I didn't have to run to my brother's wardrobe to grab extra clothes.